closes, whether it's right now with us or later, we wanted to make sure that you've got one week's notice to get your communion supplies together so that you can be ready for worship next Sunday. We have communion on the first Sunday of the month, and in October, we celebrate World Communion Sunday. And so we want to make sure you are ready. If you're wondering how you might be able to do so a little bit differently, at the church we have these little communion cups. They have a little wafer in the top and they have a little communion juice in the bottom. And you are free to come by and collect as many of those as you would like to have at home. It's also a good week to think about our schools and to think about our teachers and administrators, about all of those friends and family that come to support one another and to give thanks for them as well. And so friends, as you prepare your hearts for worship, I invite you to take a big, deep breath in and to know that God is with you wherever you are. continue our worship by joining in our words of praise. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The, the precepts, precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, it is a perfect day to be in your word to be worshiping wherever you have called us to be, carving out this time so that we can hear your scriptures, so that we can be guided by your light, so that we can be filled by your Holy Spirit. Help us, God, to worship you fully and to know your love. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
words to that hymn speak to the holiness and the majesty of God. And in the face of a holy God, we are made aware of our shortcomings. We're made aware of our sinfulness, the ways that we come up short of God's will and God's purpose for our lives. But we have that realization knowing there is grace. There is grace for us in Jesus Christ. So when we confess our sin, we know that we are confessing to a God who forgives, who heals, and who lets us start afresh. Relying on that mercy, relying on that grace, let us confess our sin together. Lord, we confess our commitment to you is a shallow one. We pledge allegiance to you one moment and deny you with our actions the next. Our faith is not strong. It wilts in the face of adversity. Yet you are a God of mercy. You do not forsake us when we forsake you. Thank you for your everlasting love that assures us of our forgiveness. Thankfully, it's not our merit, it's not our ability that assures us of our forgiveness. It is, as we just prayed, it is the mercy of the Lord that is from everlasting to everlasting that assures us of our forgiveness. Friends, that mercy is great, and it's that mercy that enables me to declare to you today with full assurance that we are forgiven. Amen. worship service called the sharing of the peace of Christ, the passing of the peace, but it's not limited to just a few moments on a Sunday morning. The peace of Christ wells up inside, overflows all week long. So I encourage you in, in these moments, there may be people around or people you could message the peace of Christ just to give them a word of encouragement, but, but don't let it stop here. God brings people to mind all the time that may need a word of encouragement, and I invite you to remember them, to share the peace of Christ in these moments and throughout the week. Well, I don't know if you can tell yet, but there are other people in the room with us today, and Miss Janie's going to come and tell us what's going on in the sanctuary and introduce you to some new and young disciples here at Westminster. As our friends come up and find their places, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we have with us today. These are students that are in our worship prep class. Uh, what we do in worship prep is basically help these students transition from our children's church and we church programs into full-time worship with their families. Um, it's especially exciting this week to be able to do um, this introduction following a baptism from last week because in that baptism we made vows we together as a church and as families we made vows that we will help raise the children in the church and help their faith and their um their their faith grow and so that's part of what we're doing here today as a part of the worship prep class we um like to present all of the students with a new bible um, a lot of times Kids get Bibles when they're babies, and then we like to give them one now as they enter into this next step in their faith journey um, and join us in worship full time. So we're going to introduce you to our friends now. This is Jarrell Jones. And we have Sophia Tietzort and Bella and Harper Lewandowski. Our long and faithful teacher, Miss Deavy. We have Kate and Haley, Lucy Spann, 
Audrey Leitner, and Cora Parrish. And now while all of our friends are in place, we're going to pray all together, okay? So dear God, dear God we, love you, we love you and we thank you, and we thank you for the opportunity, for the opportunity to, learn, to learn and to worship. Well, friends, let me catch you up. If you're doing the Bible reading through the week, then you know what you've been reading this past week. And if not, I'll, I'll give you a, a little summary of where we are. Uh, at the beginning of the week, we saw God come to Moses at the burning bush and say, Moses, you're my guy. You're the one that's going to go to Pharaoh with the message, let my people go. And Moses, after arguing and negotiating with God, he was faithful to that calling. It was intimidating, though, but Moses found the words and the strength of God. Let my people go. And you remember the the ten plagues because of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. But eventually, Pharaoh lets his people go. And, And God delivers them out of Egypt and through the parted Red Sea. And and in chapter 19 of Exodus, there's this great story where where God says it was me it was me I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt brought you out of slavery I bore you on eagles wings and brought you to myself and so where we pick up today in Exodus chapter 20 God's people liberated set free they are camped out at the base of Mount Sinai and Moses is being instructed by God to go up to the top of the mountain to meet with God face to face. Beginning in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Listen, for this is the word of the Lord. And God spoke these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, and I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, far off and said to Moses, you speak to 
Do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What I'd like to do today is to give a little bit of explanation about the meanings of the Ten Commandments, but spend a little bit more time understanding the place of the Ten Commandments for us today. And to start with, a little bit of creation theology. You know, Scripture tells us that we are created in the image of God. Human beings, male and female, created in the image of God. And theologians through the years have tried to figure out what does that mean? What does it mean to be created in the image of God? And and I want to tell you what I think it is. I, I think because God exists in three persons, a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God himself is a relationship. And so to be created in the image of God means that we are created for relationships. We are created, put on this earth, and we're in relationships. And when those relationships are healthy, we bear forth the image of God. If you look in Genesis, you can find descriptions of those relationships. There are four primary relationships that we are in. We're in this relationship with God because he's created us. We're in this relationship with each other because we're here together. We're in a relationship with ourselves. And we're in a relationship with the created order. You can see it back in the Garden of Eden, those relationships. Particularly, you can see it when sin enters into the world with the fall. Those relationships fall apart. Adam and Eve take the fruit in the middle of the garden and they, they eat it. The shadow of death falls upon them, predictably. Well, you see at that moment that instead of being in a right relationship with God, they're afraid of God, so they hide. The relationship with God is, is broken, subject to the curse. And then when God does find them and say, What's going on? Why are you covered up with fig leaves? Their answer is, we were ashamed. They experience shame because the relationship that they have with the self is crumbled and is subject to the enemy. And God, quizzing the man, says, hey, Adam, what happened? Why would you eat the fruit? And, And Adam says, do you remember the woman you gave me? He blames it on her. It's the first time that you see a division between the man and the woman. It's the first time you see a division and a horizontal relationship, relationship with others, subject to the enemy. And then as part of the curse, remember that? The thorns and thistles that will now come forth from the earth and and pain and childbearing you see a curse pronounced on the relationship that human beings have with the created order. Those relationships, as a result of the fall, are subject to the enemy of death. And then all through the Old Testament, you get to see God's people struggling with that curse. They're struggling with the enemy of death. Scripture names death is our most formidable enemy, our worst enemy. In fact, I believe it's a description of why the world is the way that it is today. Why, for instance, are there so many different religions, different people who have different paths to God? I think it's because... We're ultimately afraid. We're hiding. We're trying to find some way that we can be pleasing in the sight of a higher being. Our relationship with God 
is subject to the enemy of death? Or, or why, for instance, on a small scale, do relationships fall apart? On a large scale, nation takes up sword against nation. It's because the relationship we have with others is, is crumbling and subject to the enemy that we face. Or what about the relationship itself? Do, do you feel like you have an accurate opinion of yourself? If you're like me, then some days you think you're the greatest thing in the world, and some days oh, you just wonder why God wasted the time. We don't even know what to think about ourselves because that relationship is subject to the enemy of death or the created order. We see things like cancer perfectly just a little bit because of the curse or supposed to be refreshing now is a natural relationship subject to the curse. I think it's a description of, of what went wrong in the garden. I think it's a description of What's wrong with the world today? And so it begs the question, is there a solution to the problem? Is there an answer that is good enough to solve the problem of death? Is there anything out there that is stronger than the enemy of death? And I want you to know that that is why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important event in the history of the world. Because there's only one thing stronger than death, and it's resurrection. That's why the early church risked everything to make an announcement, to tell the world that Jesus is alive. That was the message of the early church. Did you ever think about that? The early church did not risk their lives to go out and make sure everybody knew precisely the teachings of Jesus. They went out into all the known world, risking their lives to make sure that the world knew that resurrection had happened, that Jesus is alive and that those who come to Christ those who share in the resurrected Christ are no longer subject to the enemy of death it's the good news of the gospel it's the core now back to the Ten Commandments and and what do the Ten Commandments have to do with any of it I give you all of that background because I want you to see that before Jesus came, as the solution to the problem, the law is given to try and bring some order and guidance to those relationships that are broken by the fall. The Ten Commandments and the law, they cannot solve the problem of the enemy of death but they can give some measure of help. Now let me explain that a little bit. We know that the Ten Commandments came in two tablets. And while we don't know this for sure, it makes sense that the first tablet had the first four commandments. The, the commandments that have to do with that vertical relationship that we have with God. Remember that relationship is broken and twisted but those first four commandments give some structure and guidance in order that we might have a better relationship with God. Have no other gods before me. Worship no graven images. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Those are the first four. And then beyond that, the next six, don't they have to do with the horizontal relationships that we're in? Don't they give some order and structure to those relationships that are subject to the enemy of death? Honor your father and mother. 
Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against who? Your neighbor. Do not covet what? Your neighbor's stuff. You see how the relationship with God and the relationship with, with other people are, are dealt with in the Ten Commandments. And it's not just those two relationships. The relationship we have, creation is also there in the second commandment. Don't take things from the created order and, and lift them to a place of worship. Maintain a proper understanding of your relationship with the created order. And then the relationship with self. You, you see that in the preface. God is telling his people of slavery. I redeemed your life. Remember the purpose and value because I declared you to be and who I have made you to be. The law, the Ten Commandments, they can't solve the problem, but they can give order to those broken relationships. And I think you know that when God gave the Ten Commandments, He knew that they were not a solution, but they were a guardian until a solution came. In fact, that is the precise language that the Apostle Paul uses in Galatians when he's talking about the law. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would be by the law. Paul acknowledges that the law is given, but the law, as good as it is, cannot give life. And he goes on. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith could be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The law is our guardian until Christ came. You know, Paul is explaining to us that the law has its purpose. The law is not what sets us free. And if what Paul says applies then, then you know it applies today. Does that mean that we're no longer under the law? Here's a simple question. Do you need the Ten Commandments today? This may come as a surprise for you. But Paul says, if you're a Christian, no, you don't. You don't need it. Because your heart is shaped by Christ. And so you naturally choose the good and the noble and the beautiful and the right, the good. Do you see the difference? Christians live shaped from the inside out by the Spirit of Christ. So we don't live by an external standard that we are trying to maintain. Instead, that external standard comes for us as our hearts are being shaped. Now, Paul will admit, and theologians have picked up on this, that the law may have its place. It may have its place to, to restrain the unredeemed. Or, or it may have its place to make us aware of our sinfulness, that we couldn't possibly keep the law. It may drive us toward mercy. It may drive us toward redemption. It may drive us toward the answer of Christ. But as Christians, we have Jesus. We're constrained not by those external standards. Instead, Christ is working in our lives shaping our hearts, and our life is in Him. The law couldn't give us life. Jesus Christ gives us life. And so today, I want to lift up the Ten Commandments to you, but even 
more, I want to lift up Jesus. And you may find yourself as one who struggles with the enemy that I've described. You may find yourself as one who struggles with those relationships. A relationship with God, with other people, a relationship with yourself, with the created order. And and there may be times when you're low in that struggle. There may be times when the struggle is so great you don't know what to do. And I want to suggest to you today that the law, which is trying harder, is not the solution. What that's going to do for you is it's going to drive you further down in a hole because as human beings, we can't live up to it. If you're someone who's struggling with relationships that I've described, I want you to know that the law may give you some some order, but it cannot give you life. That law that is given is a guardian that points us toward Christ. And in Christ, there is life that overcomes the enemy of death. In Christ, we are made alive to God. We are made alive to We are made alive to ourselves. We are made alive to the created order. The only hope we have is in Christ, who has overcome the very enemy that we face. Life is in Jesus. May God be praised now and forevermore. Amen. Well, friends, our song of response that you're either singing at home or you're listening to and meditating on the words is lift high the cross. It's what we do in the face of the enemies we face. We're lifting up the name of Jesus because victory is found in him. If you're able, why don't you stand?
faith this morning is taken from our brief statement of faith. If you have it printed and in front of you, I invite you to boldly share these words with me. We trust, we trust in God, God whom Jesus, Jesus called Abba Father, and in sovereign love the world good, and, and makes everyone image, male and female, of every race and live as one community. But we rebel against God, we hide from our Creator, ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Please be seated. Friends, let us turn to God in prayer. God, you created us, each of us, in your image. You created us out of love and compassion. You created us to be unique and different, so that each of us could be called together to be your church, to share the gifts to which you have given us. Help us not to hide from you. Help us to be bold. Help us to let our hearts be shaped by you. And in so doing, caring for one another, caring for those who are grieving and caring for those who have joyful news, caring for those who are waiting for tests to be taken and waiting for results to be shared. Help us to be present with those who have concerns and worries, for those who are anxious. God, let us not put down their concerns and worries. Let us truly listen as you listen to us. Let us not be judgmental. Let us be instead a light for their path as you are our light. Let us share your word with them as comfort and as strength and as a way to know what is true in a world that is filled with untruth. God, we give thanks for the children this morning and for their families that support them. We thank you for your word that is printed and available to all. God, we thank you for the way that when we open up a new Bible, it has a special meaning to us. It begins a journey, a journey where we can take notes, a journey where we can underline your scriptures, where we can be reminded that you are with us and you have been. God, help us to remember not only your words, but how you call us to pray. You call us to pray in so many ways. We pray together in worship and we pray together at home. We pray silently with our hands clenched tightly. Sometimes we kneel by our bedside and we pray. Sometimes we write our prayers out. Sometimes we send them. Sometimes we see a prayer that someone else has put together and it is like they knew our own hearts. God, so help us to continue to pray and to be bold in our prayers and to share those prayers not only with you, but to invite others to pray with us. Thank you, God, for sharing your prayer with us, a prayer that we can pray today together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we contemplate and digest, I want to just invite you to a couple of things. First, I invite you to read your October newsletter when it comes. We are putting together pieces of what a fall might look like, and we're excited to share that together as a church 
and as a community of faith. There are going to be some things in there you're going to want to stick on your refrigerator, so go ahead and make room. Also, we want to give thanks for our children and their families that came today and for the way that they have these new Bibles. I hope that you seeing their joy on their faces, even masks, with their new Bibles is a joy for you. That you are able to pull out your Bible and you are able to open it and to see maybe where you've placed notes before. Or maybe this is the first time you feel like you have permission to write in your Bible. Maybe your Bible needs a little dusting off and that is okay. Because God invites us into God's word in such a powerful way that God doesn't look backwards. God looks forward. God looks forward to spending that time with you and that time that you can have in relationship with God because you've opened up your Bible, because you've read through the pages. And even if you struggle with what God is telling you, that's okay too. So open up your Bibles just as our children are opening up theirs and know that God's word is for all of us. I also invite you to continue to check in on one another, to check in on your neighbors, whether they're Presbyterian or not, it's okay. Just to knock on their door or drop them a note and to continue to remember that we are a community that stands together joyfully and prayerfully knowing that God is with us. As we go out into the world, I invite you to remember you are indeed created in the image of God. You are indeed created to have a relationship with God and to know that Jesus Christ, his son, is there for you. And to go out into the world and share these things with others. To say, you are a child of God, just as I am a child of God. We are related through the church of Jesus Christ. Go forward and share that light with all. <laughs>